our opening words this morning are from John Murray. Go out into the highways and byways. Give the people something of your new vision. You may possess a small light, but uncover it, let it shine. Use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women. Give them not hell, but hope and courage. Preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. I'll just say a special thanks, Rod, for being here this morning. Um, very important topic, and what I liked most, well, I guess because it feeds into what I'm about to say, um, is when our speaker mentioned it doesn't we're not so concerned with who you vote for or how you vote, but try to hold in your hearts uh, a specific vision of taking care of the people of this area and our world. So how we do that and that vision is what today's sermon is about. Claiming the commonwealth. Have you heard this term, commonwealth? Has any, who's, what context do you hear the term commonwealth in? I just came from Virginia. Were you in the Commonwealth of Virginia? I think Massachusetts is a Commonwealth, right? Pennsylvania. Yeah, uh, Tennessee, I think, is a Commonwealth, right? And so what does that imply? No idea. No idea, right? <laughs> well, the words, Commonwealth, this comes from the notion that the, um, the abundance of a village or an area is held in common, right? So, um, isn't there a Boston Commons, right? And in the olden days, this is an area that the town or the community holds in common. This is not so and so's land, or you know, this is this is our land, right? It's recent, I think we're at the 100th anniversary of our National Park Service, so this is sort of a version of this commons. Um, but what I want to talk to you today about is the vision of a commonwealth and what that might mean, and and maybe you know where we are meeting that and where, where we're not quite living up to that vision and why I think it should, doggone it. So, um, I don't know about you, when I was in junior high, high school, you know, the time when you start to get civics classes and things like that, I cannot for the life of me remember learning about what Labor Day is for. I don't know, does, does anybody remember like getting real specific <coughs> information on, on Labor Day? Okay, a, a couple. Of us, right? Yeah, I asked my partner, like, did you, what did you learn about Labor Day? Um, either I wasn't paying attention, or, so that's always an option. Maybe I don't remember because I wasn't paying attention in high school. Um, but I don't really remember having, you know, if you, if you sort of listen out into the world, is there really a robust conversation about something other than barbecues <laughs> for tomorrow? And so I started to think to myself, well, like, yeah, well, what, what exactly are we doing with Labor Day? So I looked on the Department of Labor website so that they could tell me what this was about. And the Department of Labor website said this, Labor Day, the first Monday in September, is a creation of the labor movement and is dedicated to the social and economic achievements of American workers. It constitutes a yearly national tribute to the contributions workers have made to the strength, prosperity, and well-being of our country. Yeah, that's kind of cool, right? But I can, I can tell by some of the health breaths you're either waiting for what we're going to say or it's, like, to me this is actually kind of tense. And I'll tell you what makes it tense for me is the mention of these workers, right? Like, I actually feel a little bit like, like, it sounds like, is this a, is this a Marxist? <coughs> like, how, who, why do we mention workers, workers, workers? Because doesn't that set up a dichotomy? And who's the complement of the workers? Yeah, the capital, right? So we're in a nation that has a working class, and then we have a class. It's not often explained like this, but we have a class who, if they decided to, could choose not to work and just collect interest on their ownership. That's a very interesting thing. And what I propose to you is not that you go and you know destroy the whole system or something like that. Like that's statistics show that's not how lasting change is actually made. Uh, but maybe long term you can destroy that whole system and 
through uh, voting, your conscience. Um, but that the stated ideals of equality in America, right, the ones that are in front, somebody might debate me and say, well, no, it's, it's, it's in this law right here that you can, you, know, you can do this sort of what they in the Bible call usury, right? You can, you can charge people for borrowing the things that they need to survive. That's sort of written into our law, but it's not written into the face of American justice. That's an undemocratic ideal because it unlevels the playing field. Right? So the playing field means that, to the, like Jesus said in the book of Thomas, to those who have much, more shall be given. To those who have little, what they do have shall be taken away. Um, and I don't think we hear that often enough because it's like, oh, dang, dude, don't, like, whoa. And yet, if you look at how investments work, that's, that's how money is made, the real money, right? If you went, if you went to a seminar on, like, new, the new entrepreneur or something like that, it's like, no, no, don't mess around with, like, how, how old money used to be made. You know, you work for it. Money is made from money, you know, and you got to And it's, it's really true. So there's this cultural myth that we can bootstrap ourselves into success. And occasionally people do bootstrap themselves into success. But more and more, you can look the statistics up on your own or just listen to KPFA if you want after him or something like that. You'll find out that the people who have money are the people who have money. Or to put it in a less gloss over way, the people who have the resources they need to survive are the people who already have money. So it's an interesting thing, right? And so already, in terms of labor, you know, in terms of workers, like I already, I'm trying not to sound like too much of a classical Marxist, but I kind of feel like it when I read this. It's like, oh yeah, the, the workers, and that's who I am. And I want to read between the lines of who's my un unstated complement there. My unstated complement are the people who control the workers, the non-workers. Huh. So anyway, um, what comes alive in my heart is that we have a working class and we have an owning class. And this has a name, in case you're one of those people who likes to write things down and research them. This is called the inequality of bargaining power. Have you heard of the inequality of bargaining power? Maybe not under those names, but it's nice to have this. Oh, here are some workers for you. Little workers. Okay. Inequality of bargaining power. Adam Smith. Who's heard of Adam Smith? He's sort of one of the like considered like a founder of modern economic theory, right? And his classic tome, The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith says, It is not, however, difficult to foresee which of the two parties must, upon all ordinary occasions, have the advantage in the dispute and force the other into compliance with their terms. The masters, being fewer in number, can combine much more easily, and the law, besides, authorizes, or at least does not prohibit, their combinations, while it prohibits those of the workmen. We have no acts of parliament against combining to lower the price of work, but many against combining to raise it. In all such disputes, the masters can hold out longer. A landlord, a farmer, a master manufacturer, a merchant, though they did not employ, employ a single workman, could generally live a year or two on the stocks which they have already acquired. Many workmen could not subsist a week, few could subsist a month, and scarce any year without employment. In the long run, the workman may be as necessary to his master as the master is to him, but the necessity is not so immediate. So, I'm sure everyone in this room knows somebody who depends on their next patient. Right? Everybody in this room there, there may not be anybody in this room who is, depends on that, or there may be a large majority. But I, we all know in this modern world, somebody who, if you don't get your next paycheck, your life suffers seriously. And to make it more serious, you know, your kid's life suffers seriously. So then, I think in a, in a faith, in a house of faith, right, uh, not all the atheists will agree with that term, maybe you you fellowship, but we have, we have faith to a degree in these seven principles, you know, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And when we can make it so that some people have bargaining power because they can subsist, 
Other people have no bargaining power because you have to take the job that's handed to you. Okay, please raise your hand if you know someone who had to take a job that slightly violates their commitment to be with their children, or their own ethical commitments, or their health to survive. Yeah, it's pretty much just standard. Um, these are not things personally that align with my conscience. Okay. I'm also known to be an idealist, so you might say, well, what do we do about it? Well, I'll get to that part later. <laughs> so this is the issue, and I think this is why it doesn't matter what kind of organization you think is needed by labor, um, but it matters that labor is organized, that the workers take a look and notice that, you know, I have this sense, I have a lot of friends who philosophically they, they sort of lean kind of socialist, and yet Labor Day is, you know, when the ruling class deigns to give you a day off. Right? And I, her, you workers who have, like the quote said, have built the success of America. Have, have a Monday to, to barbecue and enjoy your freedom. And many of us don't even get that. Right? Labor Day is not actually a day off anymore. It's just Labor Day. <sighs> okay, I have one more little quote. If you're a college professor, you have to forgive me. This is from Wikipedia. I know that's not an authoritative source to cite, uh, but I liked the way they uh, worded this. A point of criticism, uh, this is on um, wage slavery. A point of criticism is that after people have been compelled by economic necessity to no feasible alternative than that of wage labor, exploitation occurs. Thus, the claim that wage labor is voluntary on the part of the laborer is considered a red herring, as the relationship is only entered into due to systematic coercion brought about by the inequality of bargaining power between labor and capital classes. Oi. And, you know, it's not, this is, the inspiring part comes in a minute, uh, you know, but I think if we're going to, if we're going to have a, a labor day, like, we should think about this every once in a while. Like, we should, we should all watch that movie, The Big Short, and, like, learn about the housing bubble and the systemic fraud that ruined your economy so that you could give the head of Bank of America another vacation, right? Like, and that, that just sort of went away. You know, like, we're, we're having good job recovery, and we forgot why we needed that recovery to begin with. So, I think it's important as a clergy member to call it out, like, hey, you know, like, justice and, and awesome and let's be kind, let's speak kindly to each other and, and let's open our hearts. And, meanwhile, we systemically beat down workers. Finally, at the end of the page from the Department of Labor, the vital force of labor added materially to the highest added, past tense, materially to the highest standard of living and the greatest production the world has ever known, and has brought us closer to the realization of our traditional ideals of economic and political democracy. It is appropriate, therefore, that the nation pay tribute to labor on Labor Day to the creator of so much of the nation's strength, freedom, and leadership, the American worker. And I like it. But I think it's also just a little bit condescending. Right? But yes, let's pay attention to the lower classes for one day a year. Throw them a bone, perhaps. Uh, so I think we need to get spiritual about our views and our practices around work, around money, <coughs> around wealth. Um, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr is famously quoting, quoted as saying, a budget is a profoundly moral document. Um, another way to say this is, if you want to know what my values are, look at my schedule and my pocketbook. Right? Um, so if we want to know where our values are, we need to look at who are workers and who are owners and what, you know, what the heck is going on here. So I wanted to talk to you about two things. The first part is the spiritual part, which is this vision of the commonwealth. Um, and then the second part, which will be shorter, is just a little practical piece that will come at the end. So 
for the first part, ah, the common value. Oh, don't look at that yet. I want to know. Um, last week, I think it was, I mentioned this book I read in high school, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And I, and I got a few of these and a couple of these and a two of these. <laughs> Terrible book. Uh, they didn't say it like that, but that's, that's right. <coughs> because I'm fragile. Um, <laughs> so anyway, in that book, there was this, like, seagull with, with like, psychic powers or something like that. Anyway, as chance may have it, I wanted to introduce a different book with an an about an animal with psychic powers in it uh, that I read uh, about six years after I read Jonathan Living Seagull, which is this book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. Has anybody ever read this one? Cool. So it's got, I have to say first for the, for like the, the skeptics and the economists in the room, it's got a number of logical fallacies in the book. Okay, I, I don't stand uh, wholeheartedly behind everything that it says in Ishmael. Um, but one of the things that it did say, so this, there's a telepathic gorilla in it, and he's really cool, and he's got insights that like people who are telepathic could get. Um, and what he talks about is he calls mother culture, right, which is this system of beliefs that sort of seep into your bones without really thinking about them. Right? You know, if you if you watch the telly, if you you know talk to people in coffee shops, a certain number of assumptions about how life works, what's important, um, what our values are, seep in through mother culture. Right? Um, or we talked previously about memes, right? Packets of information that propagate themselves like genetics. Um, so what I wanted to explore together was what are some of mother culture's deep beliefs and values, what are some of the means that we have around work and money as a society? Like, what have you heard? If you, okay, if you pause being like a you you for a second, you know, and, and started watching TV at the average American rate, nothing against TV watching, it's a good show, right? but, you know, the kind of the commercials that are just like steeping your subconscious in violence and fear and then uh, attachment, violence, fear, and then, ah, but then, uh, that's okay, a new car will help you with those feelings of discomfort we just created. Right? Um, <laughs> what might you be inheriting from mom culture? Yeah, Melinda? If you work hard, you'll get what you want. If you work hard, you'll get what you want. That's, I like the way you put it. I was going to say something like, if you work hard, you can make a living. Or, yeah, but you'll actually get what you want. And think about the people who work hard. And if they all get what they want. Yeah? What is it? Tell me more. Kind of just a shallow kind of living. Yeah, so like we're not even really immersed. Into, it's, it's sort of like, well, you know, you go to work over here, and then that's kind of separate from this over here, and then, yeah. What else? Other messages you've got? Yes. You deserve the new whatever. You deserve, you deserve the it. new material thing, because you're worth it. Yeah. And <coughs> you can prove your worth to yourself by buying your own product. Yeah. You buy more, you save more. <laughs> That's true. Like in bulk. Yeah. Others? Any notions? Yeah, dude. Only famous people matter, but you can buy things to make you seem like a famous That's that's absolutely what did so and so wear? Well we have a discounted version that you can get at so and so outlet stores. And you know, interesting. I I really like these comedians called Key and Peel. Um, they they did a spoof on sports reporting and it was teaching center. You know, and they were like, oh, this one, she she brought in her own books from the library, and she's, you know, oh, she raised them, she, she practiced, you know, teaching to all of the eight different emotional intelligences with all of her students. Wow, what's she making this year? Well, she just signed on for another million. You know, and it's like, but no, that's not how we treat teachers. <laughs> that's how we treat, like, people who throw pigskin around a field. Not to demote pigskin throwing, but, you know, like, what values do they teach your youth? Well, I mean, there isn't a specific set of values. They don't teach literacy necessarily. They, they don't teach civics necessarily. They just teach throw pig skin and run into each other or something like that. And then some are cool and some are like really not cool. But let's pay them all a bunch of money. Right? So just in the sake of time, I'd love to hear all of yours later. But I have a couple slides just as I fiddled through the internet that struck me as what I think I've inherited. 
Okay, this little Pokemon says, when wealth is passed off as merit, bad luck is seen as bad character. This is how ideologues justify punishing the sick and the poor. Right? Wealth is merit. If you're wealthy, you, you're a success. You must have made it, right? For your qualities. I like this guy. I sold an hour of my life for $13. Doesn't sound nearly as good as I make $13 an hour. Right? We don't, maybe that's what I get from that detachment word for me, is we don't think about that. that is the only human lifetime you get. And what did you do with it? Did you, we don't necessarily uh, consider what we just contributed to the world. We consider, did I make enough money to survive and pay my bills? Or if you, you've gotten there, did I make enough to go out drinking this weekend or something like that to recover from slightly hating myself for 60 hours a week if that's what it takes to serve the man and not get fired instead of <coughs> 40. Right. Sorry. Good, buddy. Okay, um, I like this one. <laughs> and one of the things that is, we, there's a whole other discussion that we could have about uh, division of labor and gender roles and things like that. But here's something somebody said to me, which is there's been a change in language from homemaking to housework. And to me, this sort of speaks to this commonwealth and a paradigm. You don't make a home, it's just chores to do. You, instead of having, and I know people who were homemakers didn't all have these beautiful, really, that's not what I'm saying at all. But if I wanted to be a homemaker now, like that's, that's not a real life path, right? Like, because what's homemaking? Like, what is, that's not getting you ahead anywhere. It's worthless. There's housework that you have to do after you get home from like managing your investments or whatever, but like <laughs> raising a kid and feeding your partner nutritious food and like making things beautiful, how useless. <laughs> so housework is evil, but I think homemaking is divine, personally. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, the American dream, 1946, a house was the American dream, perhaps. In 1966, freedom. In 1986, a big house. In 2016, a job that brings in enough money to not starve. <laughs> and we're starting to get this in our memetics, in our cultural memes. So I wanted to bring this up because there's this old Sufi story that says um, if, you, if you went up to a fish, it's a lot of telepathic and talking animals in this sermon today. So, if you went up to a fish and you said, like, hey, do you know where to find water around here? Right. The fish would have no idea what you talk about. Like, no, dude, I've never heard of that. And I don't know. Water? What's that? Right? And you're total, he's totally surrounded in it. The same thing is true for culture. Right? For many of us, if you know, if I were to say, like, and then here's this thing from the Department of Labor, and they say workers, and what the heck's up with that? And people go like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, enjoy the barbecue. We got Coronas, we got fat tire, like, what kind of risk do you want? And like, chill, okay, we got a day off. Because these messages are not things that are coming through the front door of conscious awareness. They're coming through this lower door of subconscious awareness. And so our views about who gets to succeed, who has to fail, or again, I want to today put it in a stronger language, who gets to eat and who has to stop, right? These are things that are going on a totally subconscious level. And I think if we are people of conscience, we have to bring them up to a very conscious level. So, what I would like to... Oh, yes, this one. Just let's see if I can find my little slide here. Uh, so, we have the quote from the Department of Labor that said, you know, the thing that made, that made America reach its economic and democratic goals was the American worker. And yet... This one comes from a website called inequality.org. Productivity has increased at a relatively consistent rate since 1948, but the wages of American workers have not. Since the 1970s, kept up with this rising productivity. Worker hourly com compensation has flatlined since the 70s, increasing just 15.5%. Okay, so 15.5% wage increase. Worker productivity has increased 132.8% over the same time period. So I, I just like to, to show this that if you're the if you're the owner or job creator, that's very good news. Right? 
product, you're getting all of this stuff for the one or five people who own the company. And if you're the worker, that's very bad news because there is no common wealth. Right? The, the wealth, it's obvious that that myth is false. The wealth goes to one or a small group of people and you beg for scraps. So, this is something that is a good idea to think about on Labor Day. It's uncomfortable to think about. For me, I recently read a book, again, to the uh, skeptics, I don't necessarily recommend this book, because again, there's a lot of like sort of fringe stuff in it. But he said one beautiful thing, this author Charles Eisenstein, said that it's important not only to be able to act, not only to be able to, to take the decisions, but we have to actually hold the vision of the what he called the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. I know that it's important to vote on very specific issues. I know that it's important to march, to sign petitions, to do all of these wonderful things. And the only thing that strengthens those activities, that gives you the stamina to be able to push and, and like withstand the facts that I'm throwing at you, which sort of stand on their, I mean, you can kind of debate it, but the whole productivity to wage, like that's just kind of ugly no matter how you spin it, right? Um, the only way to sit there and go, okay, well, give me more facts, is to have a deeper vision of something that you do want. We've been barraged this morning by me, by things that many of us do not want. What I ask us is, what might a commonwealth look like? We have suffered from the influence of past memes. There's one meme that says, if there's an aristocracy, God must have made it. We've had that since uh, monarchy uh, rule, right? and it still infests our culture. <coughs> we are just coming out of the meme that gave rise to our industrial revolution. That said, and it's true, that if you work hard, you can succeed. And yet, we're coming to realize that in a deeply, globally interconnected world, that particular vision of culture misses a few important points. And when you miss important points like that, people die. So what is the next vision of wealth, labor, and work that we need to invoke inside our hearts? This is the spiritual part of my talk to you this morning. The practical part. Now that you've got a vision, and the vision I propose is called a commonwealth, <coughs> whether you think it's going to take 50 years or 5,000 years to accomplish, I propose to you that if you feel <coughs> all beings have inherent worth and dignity, that it's important to act in compassionate ways toward them, that we live as part of an interconnected web, then the way that we engage with wealth, class, and labor is, I almost don't want to say it, but I think it's a sin. And a vision of how we might live without sinning that way, right? From this root word that means to miss the mark. And it means to separate, to see us all as separate, that nothing impacts the other. How might we live if we knew that wealth was common, that sharing was one of the highest ideals of this life, perhaps the deepest encoded ideal of the human heart. So I want to offer you one practice before we leave, and that is this. Don't, wait, which one is it, patronize or patronize? Patronize any company that you wouldn't work for. Okay, and this might be, uh, you might only be able to try this as a week-long experience or something like that, but I suggest try, like, go a day, do a day with a fast of no slave labor companies or something like that. You know, so for me, this morning I went to, I was thinking about this, I was like, okay, wait a minute, I would probably work for Whole Foods, because their employees are moderately happy, the ones that I know, right? If I like my current job, thank you, I'm not. Um, <laughs> And then I had to wonder, like, wait a minute, is my coffee fair trade? Right? The, the cup of coffee that I just bought, I know this person makes a decent wage, um, but 
what about the people that we sourced our materials from? Mm -hmm. So how deep does your conscience go? Does it stop when the new gadget comes out? You know, are you, and I would like, personally, this is just a personal question, I'd like you to think if you're going to buy the new gadget, think about what kind of labor went into producing it. And sometimes we have to live with it. Maybe if you try this experiment, maybe you need a little bit of a cap and trade thing. Like, you know, I know that I can't do my daily Google search, how to save the world, you know, unless I have a decent computer and um, but I have to recognize that the machines that I bought and the people that I bought them from are founded on systemic injustice. And when I think that way, it's not just sadness. Right? There's also a type of strength that comes along. I would like you tomorrow, if you have the day off, to you know, forget this sermon for a couple of hours and please just have a beer, you know, and like a vegan or standard hot dog. And then, maybe before you go to bed, light a little candle and feel a little sad and a little strong about how much work we really need to do to have a culture that is truly equitable together. So in this spirit, if you would, please...